Good morning, everyone, and again, welcome to today's gathering of grantees of the MacArthur Funds for Culture, Equity, and the Arts at the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. I hope you've had a chance to grab some breakfast and settle in. My name is Arusha Keel, and I am an arts program officer here at the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. It's nice to be able to meet most of you in person today, and thank you for taking the time to be here with us in community. If, you've, if you haven't had a chance to speak to the panelists or the Driehaus staff members, uh, there will be time towards the end for more networking. I also ask that you silence your phones so that we don't have any disruptions during the panel discussion. I'd also like to acknowledge that we are on Potawatomi land. The Potawatomi people were long the residents and stewards of this land until non-native settlers arrived and displaced them. Many other tribes, past and present, have relationships with this land, including the Ojibwe and Odawa nations, which alongside the Potawatomi comprise the councils of the three fires. The Peoria and Kuskokia nations of Illinois Confederacy and the Ho-Chunk, Kikapoi, Muscatine, Menominee, Meskaki, Miamia, Takiwaki, and Weya nations as well as mound builders and other peoples whose names were lost through genocidal, ethnocidal colonialism. Chicago became home to one of the largest urban indigenous populations in the United States after the Indian Relocation Act brought tribal members from their lands to cities in part to encourage assimilation. Members of this local population who represent 175 or more tribes continue to support the area's health, life, and vibrance by celebrating their heritage, practicing their traditions, and caring for the environment we share. We embrace, honor, and respect these practices and values that represent the many Native communities now here. The Foundation's continued learning, listening, and reflection are integral to our commitment to benefit the common good and support our shared humanity. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Driehaus Foundation Executive Director Anne Lazar to share a few words. Please welcome Anne. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here with everyone and thank you for taking the time to join us in this beautiful space. In 2021, the Driehaus Foundation was pleased to present Epiphany Center of the Arts with one of Historic Preservation's most respected awards, a Landmarks Illinois Richard H. Driehaus Foundation Preservation Award. Originally constructed in 1885, by architects Burling and Whitehouse, the grand building was a place for people to congregate and an important part of the West Side community. With its distinctive Richardsonian Romanesque architecture, beautiful terracotta tiles, and magnificent bells, it was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 1998. I've had the privilege of spending time with its owners, learning the details of this incredible adaptive reuse project and about Epiphany's mission to exist for the good of art, entertainment, and events. While the neighborhood has gone through many transformations, Epiphany is outstanding in, its achi in achieving its goal to instill an artistic cultural experience in all patrons who cross its threshold with the hope that each will be inspired to realize their own Epiphany. As the Foundation reflects on our relationship with each of your organizations, we are continually grateful for all that you contribute to Chicago's arts community. Its vibrancy depends on your outstanding creativity and talent. And while we may now shift our role to audience members instead of grant application reviewers, we applaud you and look forward to your continued work and accomplishments. Thank you for sharing your day with us, and it is our hope that today's program will be beneficial as you work to support your goals. Thank you, Anne. Uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to our facilitator and panelist, Ellen Placey Wadey, who is Program Director for Chicago Art and Collections at the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation. Ellen also serves as board co-chair of Artswork Fund and serves on the board of Enrich Chicago. You can learn more about Ellen and the Donnelly Foundation, as well as her fellow panelists you're about to meet in the digital program you received via email, which is also linked to the QR codes you see around the room. 
morning, everybody. It's so exciting to see all your faces. I haven't seen, I've been running around just hugging people. Like, I need to make sure you're 3D. <laughs> like, so it's really great to see you all, and thanks so much for being here today. Um, we're going to start out today. I'm just going to take us down the line and have everybody introduce themselves, and I'll ask an icebreaker question. But I did want to acknowledge that, you know, our much beloved Marcia, Marcia Feston isn't able to join us today. Um, she had something come up very suddenly. And so Sue Ellen Burns is going to pinch hit. So it is baseball season. That's the way it's supposed to be. So um, between the two of us, Sue Ellen and I will talk about Arts Work Fund. Um, but just wanted to acknowledge Marcia's not here and everybody sent her good thoughts. Um, so, with that, I am going to pass it to our commissioner, Erin Harkey, and my icebreaker question is, what's the first concert you ever went to? It was, um, hi everybody. Um, it was Simply Red um, <laughs> at the Palladium in uh, Los Angeles. And now I'll pass it to Richard. Morning, folks. My name is Richard Tran. Um, I'm with the Field Foundation. I use the he pronoun, they he pronouns. And the first concert in English I ever attended was, uh, it was Katy Perry, Warp Tour, 2008, I Kissed a Girl era. Nice. Sue Ellen. Okay, um, good morning everyone. Thank you for being here. So um, I'm here to do my best to pinch it for Marsha. I'm on the steering committee of Arts Work Fund as, it, as is Ellen, so that explains me being here. Um, I am senior program director at the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation. My first concert was 1983. It was U2 at the State University of New York at Albany's. Help me out here, Kate, if you know the name of it. No way! We are, we're from the same hometown. Um, and it was, it was like called Summerfest or Springfest or something. You were there too? That's crazy. Um, and this was like, be, nobody really knew who they were. What a great first concert. Okay, everybody on the panel is cooler than me. <laughs> My first concert, now I'm gonna set the context. I was a sophomore in high school. My parents didn't let me go anywhere. I was desperate to go to a concert, so I went to Sha Na Na at Old Chicago. <laughs> and was delighted to be there, too. Um, so just want to remind folks again that the bios for everybody are on this program, and also on the back of the program is a listing of you know the organizations we represent, some of the funding details, and there's also a QR code so you can catch it that way. And so I'm going to start the conversation. So we know general operating support is really important. And so I'm going to start with you, Commissioner Harkey. How do general oper operating grants fit within the broader context of your organization's work and grant making? And then just take it down the line. Um, so I think every, everybody knows and probably feels that uh, in the last couple of years, DKS is really um, had a kind of transformational influx of resources, uh, which included a $10 million uh, boost to our cultural grants program that came from new money allocated from the corporate budget that Mayor Lightfoot helped us uh, secure. Um, so that $10 million has really enabled us to really shore up and grow our grant making program, including increasing direct general operating support to uh, arts and culture nonprofits, and also allowing those arts and culture nonprofits that receive support through our city arts program to have renewable two-year grants. Um, so uh, that's a program that's currently operating at about $10 million total. Um, we had, uh, last year we had about uh, $6.5 million in grants that we gave out. We're gonna be renewing those this year and also adding an additional about three million in general operating grants. Uh, and this is all through our city arts program. So it's the largest uh, grant making program that we have in our portfolio, but um, is certainly I think one of the most uh, impactful. Well worth applause. And um, in terms of any eligibility parameters, anything like that, anything you want to note? 
Well, City Arts is open to, to any arts and culture nonprofit. We do segment by a budget size, which is something I think we're hoping to look at from a kind of equity standpoint going forward. Um, but it's open to any arts and culture nonprofit. We do obviously track um, things like geography. Uh, you know, we um, off, 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 are looking obviously to increase support in communities that we have historically not been able to reach, um, but it is open to any, any arts and culture nonprofit. Great, thanks. Richard, Field Foundation has a new partner. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, so why don't we talk a little bit about how GenOps fits into the program moving forward and then again, any eligibility criteria you wanna note. For sure. Can folks see me all right? Awesome. Um, so within the greater context of the Field Foundation, within all four program areas that we do have art, justice, media and storytelling, as well as leadership investment, there are gen ops across all, like every program area. For arts specifically, as Ellen has mentioned, um, we partnered with the MacArthur Foundation and we recently announced a Road Together, Field Foundation's new art program, new grant making program. With this new program, 100% of all Field Foundation arts program grants will be general operating support, right? There's no question about it, right? It's just 100% general operating support. Um, with that program, specifically for the A Road Together art program, there'll be a three-year general operating program as well as a one-year general operating program. Both applications look the same, eligibility is very similar, um, but the one key thing to note is we are trying to support organizations with budgets under $1 million. Prior to this transition and partnership with the MacArthur Foundation for the art program, our priority area was really at that $500,000 level and below, um, but with this partnership, we're expanding quite a bit. Um, and with that, you know, I do want to share that prior to the transition, we had about 25 organizations who would engage with the art program annually. We're hoping to expand that to about 75 organizations per year. I think we can either make it a clapping game, which I think is good, or maybe a drinking game. Every time we hear Jen up, everybody take a sip. <laughs> Sue Ellen, you want to talk? Yeah, let me get you mid-sip. That's what I like to do. Um, let's talk a little bit about Arts Work Fund. Um, so, Arts Work Fund, many of you may know, has been around for about 15 years. And what we have been doing at Arts Work Fund up until just a few minutes ago is um, capacity building grants, so project grants exclusively for arts organizations of all disciplines in the Chicago and Cook County area. So we've been doing that for a very long time. A few years ago, Arts Work Fund brought together a group of grant seekers and said, tell us what else we can do. And no surprise to Arts Work Fund, we heard general operating grants. That's what we would like to see next. And so through um, quite a long process that had a few pauses because of COVID, because instead we pivoted to emergency relief funding um, with many partners like DCASE, which was very exciting, and if Arts Alliance Illinois is here. Um, but what Arts Work Fund did is really listen to grant seekers about the needs and through a, um, a four-year grant from the Builders Initiative, we were able to develop the new Thrive grant making program, which is meant to be complementary to the capacity building grants that Arts Work Fund will continue to do. What's important to say about Thrive is that it was designed by grant seekers. So exact folks just like you. Is anyone from the design committee here today, the design team? Thank you, Charlique. Charlique was on the design team. There was 12 individuals represented on the design team who said, these are the guidelines that matter. This is the criteria that matters. This is what we wanted you to think about. Three-year general operating grants. So we had our first application deadline February, right? Um, specifically for three-year general operating grants. It's, this is new territory for Arts Work Fund, but we are thrilled to be doing this. And um, lots of folks are paying attention, and we're, we are iterating some of it as we go, so I can't answer maybe every detailed question, but part of why we're iterating as we go is so we can listen and hear and be responsive and not have everything set in stone until we know how it's going to unfold, but we're really excited about it. Oh, restrictions. 
You asked about that. So art service organizations are not eligible for Thrive, nor are organizations whose primary purpose is arts learning or arts education. Um, but every other discipline is in the a creative discipline is represented in terms of eligibility. And I think it's groups with budgets, is it up to one million or up to two million? Maybe it's two million. We have to have a budget under $2 million to be eligible. And so I'm with the Gaylord and Dorothy Donnelly Foundation, and um, we've been gen op funders as long as I can remember, back when I was writing grants, asking, trying to solicit funds for my organization. Uh, we do multi-year funding. It is in the Chicago metro area. I always say we don't give the biggest grants in town, but we do give consistently to the groups that we partner with. Um, we fund all disciplines and traditions. We also support art service organizations. Um, all of that with gen op money, because you know, you guys know where the money needs to go. You don't need us looking over your shoulder telling, telling us spend it on this or spend it on that. You're, do, you're making a nickel do like $5 worth of work. So we, we just want to get the money out the door and um, into your hands to do good work. Um, and I'm trying to think, the other thing I'll just mention, because I see some folks here who are um, more in kind of the museums collection-y kind of world, is we do have another program, Broadening Narratives. It's a project-based program, but um, it focuses on the narratives that are, t that are have either been mistold, um, not told, or incompletely told. So, you know, you can also look on our website. And by um, collections, we're not just meaning museums and libraries. We know lots of people have archives and important archives. And so we're interested in any of the stories that can be told by those. And we do have some flexibility. We have some capacity, build, capacity building stuff that kind of like, you know, the um, Think Explorer that, you know, they are project based, but they have a lot of flexibility. So next question, I'll go to Richard and then we'll go around the circle again. Um, so general operating support, you know, we know it's the golden standard, but it'd be interesting, I think, for, for folks to hear like how foundations think about it and how they talk about general operating and why they believe it's important. So I'm gonna start with you. You know, everything Ellen just said is probably what I'll echo. Uh, really, at the end of the day, we know that y'all know what's needed the most, right? I think, I myself, I'm from Chicago, I'm from Uptown, I came from lots of different community organizations, so I have my own sense of what needs to happen within my own community, right? And as, you know, I look out into this crowd and see folks that are leaders of these organizations, I, oh, okay, my apologies, I was gonna curse. Um, I sure as heck know that like, y'all are gonna know better than me, right? Like, so my position, I believe this is the position of everyone at the Field Foundation is, we know that philanthropy is a tool, right? We know this is not gonna solve everything in the world, every single issue that we have, but we can use this as a tool together and as a tool that we can see that can have actual real ramifications, actual outcomes, because we know money is important in our society today, right? That, that is not in question. And so how can we as a foundation provide more tools out there for folks to be able to use those tools for the benefit of everyone around? right, at the end of the day. And so Gen Up support specifically is us saying, instead of me giving you just a hammer, here's an entire toolbox. Do what you need to do. And I think that's pretty much our stance. Want to add anything to that, to Ellen and then Kamish? Um, much like what Richard said, at Arts Work Fund, general operating support is strategic and foundational because that's what grant seekers have told us. And we're listening. And um, there is, the Artwork Fund is made up of a steering committee of funders, but Marsha and now Lynette Miranda, who's been working with us for the last six months to develop this program, everything in it was grounded in what we heard. And it's, it's no surprise to all of you, but we at Artwork Fund are in a position to be responsive, which is super exciting, thanks to the Builders Initiative. Yeah, I don't know that I had of anything, you know, kind of else to add other than, you know, I think the kind of listening, right, um, community engagement part around developing grant programs is extraordinarily important. Um, and before we make any changes to any, you know, kind of grant program, 
And before we made changes to the city arts application, we spent a lot of time talking to people. So the adjustments that we made were a reflection of what we were hearing uh, that folks needed, right? Um, we also like circulate stuff amongst our peers um, just to make sure that you know the stuff that we're doing and the stuff that we're putting out there is a complement to other grant programs that might also be happening. Um, and we know that you guys need general operating support. You tell us that over and over and over and over again. Like we hear it. So you know that is where the majority of the funding that we have uh, for our grants program goes because we know that that is the most I think beneficial to you. I feel that also on the other side. You know, as a person that also receives you know grants, and we're a little bit different in terms of that. You know, we receive also receive grants from from, from philanthropy. So I get the you know, need to, you know, have as few restrictions on the money as possible um, so that we can be nimble, right, and make adjustments if needed. Um, so, yeah. Um, I, think that's it. yeah the, I think the only other thing I'd add to that is, you know, anytime you're talking to any program director, program officer, commissioner, we all have folks that we're advocating up to as well. You know, we don't make the decisions on our own. And so, you know, as many um, reasons that you can give us to give them of why to continue general operating support. Because um, I will say sometimes if you're not in the day-to-day -day business of it, it just feels a little mushy, right? Um, folks are thinking like, well, how do we know what the money is doing? And we have to really talk about the organizations as a whole. We have to talk about the, the artists that it's helping to support. We're talking about the productions that are going on. But, you know, the more information and, you know, kind of great stories you can give us, that gives us more to go up to the folks that we report to, whether it's just reaffirming why we do general operating support, or at times, you know, could be freeing up money to do general operating support. So I would say that. And then the only other thing I would say is the great thing about GenOp is its flexibility. Because we know right now it is a weird world out there for everyone. Audiences are haphazard, I think is probably a good word to describe them. <laughs> um, lots of you folks are trying to pay the folks that you work with better. And that wasn't necessarily something you budgeted for three years ago, two years ago, even one year ago. And so, you know, it lets you direct those funds where you need them. Um, so I think that's the other really important thing about GenOp and why all of us up here support GenOp and advocate for it is because we know sometimes the things you need to pay for, you don't know what they are right now. Next question. I'm going to start with you, Sue Ellen, because there's a pattern and I want to stick with it. <laughs> um, the next question is mostly, you know, kind of looking not just at our own organizations, but a little bit more broadly. And I think it's a way that maybe we can also talk about arts funding in Chicago as a whole in terms of what we're seeing with general operating, with how funding is working in Chicago. Um, how we try to collaborate with each other in order to keep the ecosystem healthy, things like that. Well, collaboration is at the core of ArtsWork Fund. We are a funder collaborative. Um, and we talk a lot about what we can do collectively. And what's really exciting is how amplified the uh, what's the way to put it? How amplified the voices are about the need for general operating support, and it just makes us it easier for us to make the case to our own boards and more broadly to our peers and colleagues. There are folks like the Donnelly Foundation has, who has been doing general operating support for ever. Um, and for anyone who works in philanthropy to be able to point to Donnelly and say, this is an example of the best in class in terms of philanthropy and who has been responsive all this time makes anybody else's job easier. And especially one of the things that's really helpful when you're trying to present the case in philanthropy for general operating support is things like the conversations we have with individual grantees and grant seekers who tell us their stories that then we can use to support the case. And 
I have been on both sides of the table in fundraising for 30, more than 30 years here in Chicago. And the conversations about general operating support were teeny tiny, barely 25 or 30 years ago. And now I think amongst, I don't want to speak for any of my other colleagues who are in arts philanthropy, but I will speak for myself as a steering committee member, but also through the Driehaus Foundation, we hear and participate in conversations all the time with our colleagues, thinking about what else can we do and what we can do together. And things like, I want a, a huge shout out to Aaron. When DCASE was looking at what to do with this funding, they talked to grant seekers, but we also had several conversations that DCASE convened. So they asked us, what are we hearing and how can we weigh in and how can we support you? And having that really helps ground all of us in um, aligning when we can and complementing when we can, and most importantly, collaborating when we can. Well said. And thanks for the compliment, I'll pay you later. Um, I, think, I think one of the other things that um, folks might not realize is that you know, you know who the arts funders are, but I know every single one of us gets calls from folks who might not be in the arts funding lane, but they get an idea of something they wanna do. And um, I just had a call yesterday with a, with a foundation, and even though they almost always come in with a project idea, we're always kind of like, well, you know, you might just want to give the organization the money and, you know, talk with them about the thing you want to make happen, and they can make it happen. But, you know, let it be as flexible as possible. So I think that's another thing to keep in mind is that, you know, we're always out pitching for the arts because the... Every single one of us up here has been part of it, loves the arts. Um, that's the reason why we do what we do. And, you know, we're always trying to figure out, like, how do we bulk up the ecosystem more? How do we bulk up the funding more? Um, and, you know, I think there's been a couple of foundations that came online, actually, during the pandemic. And we've been in conversation with them. Builders Initiative is the primary funder of this new Arts Work Fund, Genot Fund. So, you know, it's we're always... I guess I'm trying to say, at times I think folks might misinterpret that we don't love Gen Op as much as you do, but we do. <laughs> Anything you want to add, Richard or Aaron? Okay. So, our next question, and I'm going to start with Richard on this, is how is your funding program navigating shifts in arts funding priority and practice particularly related to racial and cultural equity, and what do you think it's important for organizations to bear in mind about that? That's a big question. Um, navigating the shifts, you know, I think that, I don't just think, I, I firmly believe that at the Field Foundation, um, we, they, you know, I've only been with Field for about three years now, um, Folks in leadership have been on a learning journey for a very long time, right? Under past leadership, there's been so many transitions to what field specifically wants to prioritize. And we're at a place today where we just can flat out say and know and publicize in all of the ways racial equity is the lens, <clears throat> my apologies, in which we're going to be navigating our work. And that is not in question, right? We have had so many conversations with leaders from all across the city, members, not just leaders, right? Community stakeholders, business owners, organization leaders, folks who are just participants, right? We've had all of these conversations to know why this priority makes so much sense. And then on top of that, we've done the research, right? We have what we call at the Field Foundation our heat maps. And our heat maps are a collection of oh, hordes and hordes of so much data across you know, education, health outcomes, poverty, socioeconomic class rather, um, school closures, you know, across the, the board of all of these different indicators. And then we have a few updates now of indicators of just the arts sector. Where are arts organizations, arts and culture organizations located in the city? Point blank period, just where, right? Where do folks have access to these spaces? Where are the for-profit spaces, right? Because it's not just the ecosystem of the nonprofits that we're talking about, but we're talking about everything related to arts and culture, arts service, organizations that use the arts but just aren't arts alone, right? We know that there's an entire ecosystem out there, but we also need to know who's, being able, who's able to access all of this, why they're able to access it or not, 
And what are the other ways we can help fill the gaps? Because that is so incredibly important in our time right now in this world. So navigating the shift, it's really thinking about history, power structures, systems, policy, right? All of these things that, that are so nuanced and can't just be understood in a given statement or a, just a panel discussion. Uh, but things that we're really considering, right? Because at the end of the day, we have the on the ground know-how from folks, right? Who are saying, this is what's been missing. And we also have the data. And data, as I'm sure we all know, data is not perfect. But the data is overwhelmingly telling us the same narrative. And so we're following that, right? It is fact-based, it is narrative-driven, it is human-centered. And that's how we're, we're navigating this shift. Thank you, that's passionate and well said. Um, Swellen, I'm gonna go to you next and then I'll come to the commissioner and I'll round it out. I'm so excited about Richard's response that I have forgotten the question. Could you repeat it? Well, not forgotten it, but could you repeat it? I can as soon as, see, I'm trying to act like I'm a Gen Zer and read my questions off my phone. Um, how is your funding program navigating shifts, shifts, so arts work fund, in arts funding priority and practice, particularly related to racial and cultural equity, and why do you think it's important? Um, that is a really big question. I'll, I'll speak about a couple of things that channeling my inner Marsha that I think, that I hear Marsha emphasize. The first, in terms of navigating shifts, is evolving to grant seeker driven programs and even decision making. That has been a really exciting shift for Artswork Fund. So for Think, Explore, Share, which is our, our capacity building grants, the, we went from Marsha representing the in, in conversations with grant seekers and then coming to the steering committee to make decisions to now a panel of actual grant seekers who represent the profile of folks who are seeking support are the ones who are making funding recommendations. That is a big change and very exciting for Arts Work Fund. It's generally known as participatory grant making. And there's a whole range of, of ways one can be a have a participatory model, but Arts Work Fund is grounded in the recommendations coming from folks like you. The next evolution is the development of Thrive and using grant seekers to actually tell us how to develop a program itself. And we're seeing that more and more, I think, with, with grant makers locally and some outside of that. It's a really exciting evolution. So while those of us who are here on stage and my other colleagues from the Driehaus Foundation do this work and we deeply care about it, we are not in the same seat as you are and we should be listening and responding to what you tell us is important. Finally, for Arts Work Fund, um, we have been prioritizing racial and cultural equity organizations explicitly in grant making for, it's been a shift that's been about eight or nine years in the making. Um, what's very exciting to us about Thrive is that Thrive, the focus now is on organizations that um, are by, for, and about people of color, women-centered, LGBTQ plus-centered, and folks who work at the intersection of that. And community relevance is a driving factor in what will ultimately the, be the decisions in Thrive. And all of those are um, strategic evolutions for Arts Work Fund, and ones that have been in the works for a long time, but this is our next actualization of that. Commissioner Herkey? Um, I have a lot to say, so I'm trying to like, in my mind, I was like, how am I gonna make this like cohesive? So, um, okay, so government is a little bit different than private foundations in terms of like what we can um, establish as eligibility criteria, right? So we do not make distinctions by race, but we can do other things like um, prioritize geography and income levels in communities. Um, However, as you can expect, that is in somewhat a proxy, right, for um, sort of uh, identifying communities of color because communities of color are also um, historically lower income. Um, in a city like Chicago, are also in certain geographies. Um, and so that sort of helps us 
um, when we're determining and prioritizing different communities. We can also, I think, build programs that help us to reach communities that have historically been um, underserved. Um, the, um, I think in the big landscape of things, we of course have general operating support, but we also have a number of uh, project-based support programs that we also have been looking at um, ways to extend access uh, and participation in the arts. And one of the things that we have done is also included in those project-based support grants to social service and community-based nonprofits and also religious institutions that have uh, cultural missions outside of their religious ones. And we're seeing with those grant programs in particular, right, that we're getting a much better um, reach, right, into um, communities of color in our city. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of important is that we, uh, about, uh, before the pandemic, we launched into this pretty comprehensive look at uh, kind of funding, um, both public and private sector funding and where it was going in the city. We were able to um, work with, with SMU Data Arts, who many of you know, um, you know, in relationship to the Cultural Data Project, to identify cultural organizations that were theoretically eligible for uh, grants to, uh, from the city, but for whatever reason had not applied. So we now have data that we know where organizations are so we can be very, very targeted in our outreach to certain communities and be able to reach them. So we, we know where you are, you haven't applied, I just need you to apply, right, to get into the program. So we've been able to create some more, I think, grassroots strategies. Um, I will direct all of you, I wish I could like show maps because the work is working. Um, so I'll direct all of you actually to our 2022 impact report. Um, we have an individual artist program as well. Um, sent from 2019 to 2022, we increased, um, just through these strategies, we increased um, direct grants to BIPOC individual artists from 33% to 60% in just two years. Um, we're also seeing that um, we give out about uh, 680 grants a year. Uh, that was last year. 25% of that 680 grants were uh, people that had never received support from the city. Um, and we're also seeing, if you looked at a map from grantees from 2019 through 2022, there is a much, much, much better like geographic distribution, especially in our kind of critical south and west side neighborhoods. Um, so, you know, I think all of those strategies kind of working together. And then also, I think, you know, Sue Ellen mentioned, um, you know, we've been doing participatory grant making forever. That's just how... Um, you know, governments do things is the kind of pan the panel system. Um, and I think making sure, right, that panelists, right, are reflective of the communities that we're trying to reach is also incredibly important. And so we've invested a lot of resources in that. And I think about 75%, I think, of the panelists that we do have reviewing our applications identify as BIPOC. So that helps to make sure that we are also doing the outreach to those organizations to make sure that they, you know, know about these, that they're um, also aided through the process, right, in terms of filling out these applications. But then, you know, community, communities, um, panelists can also speak to the individual needs of specific communities when evaluating, right, applications that are seeking to serve those communities, right? So there's that knowledge, right, and we're more confident that uh, the programs that we're funding are going to be doing the work that we need them to do. Can I say one more thing about Arts Work Fund? Um, something that is a really important um, evidence of what we're doing is holding ourselves accountable about representation within the grants that we make. So at a leadership level, at every meeting, we look at who, have we, who applied, who did we make grants to, what profiles do they represent, who's underrepresented, and what are we gonna do about it? And that changes our approach to community engagement in real time to make sure that folks who aren't as represented as they are in the population of the city of Chicago, we are prioritizing and reaching out to and very much with a one-on-one -on -one approach with those folks. And it has driven a whole lot of Marsha's outstanding work in the past few years.
So I think I want to start by just saying, I, you know, shifts and change are hard. You know, it's just changing is hard. And it can feel like um, that somehow it can be against you instead of inviting you to be part of it. And so I, can, I know I can speak for all of my colleagues who are in arts philanthropy. We know you're all doing amazing work. None of this is about, any of the changes that happen is, isn't about not thinking you're doing amazing work and doing it against the odds, right? Because you're not getting as much funding as it, you know, you're always trying to figure out like, how do we do this production when we have half the amount of money that we need to make it happen? So, you know, just to know that every single conversation that when we're together talking about respective things, that's always where we start, is how amazing the arts work that happens in Chicago is. But we are in the midst, midst of a shift. And so for Donnelly, you know, one of the things we look at is um, that tension between of what our city is and is not. So we are an unusual city in that we are 30% Latin A, 30% African American and 30% white. Um, that's, un, you know, many other cities don't have that kind of even spread, so we're very unusual that way. The other thing is, is we still end up on one of the top 10 most segregated cities in the nation. So the kind of shorthand I've used for that is we have more different kinds of people not talking to each other. And we also know the arts can change that. We know that the arts can be a place that invites people in to learn about other folks, to engage with challenging ideas. You know, also you guys are doing lots of great work around joy right now because we all need more of that in our lives. But you know, this is hard work. And so when we're looking at, you know, who we're inviting in for applications, when we're reviewing um, the proposals and thinking about who we're funding, we're always thinking about that 30, 30, 30, most segregated city and one of the most segregated cities in the country. And that means that some different choices, you know, um, and I'm also thinking about, like I'm on the Enrich board and we're gonna be doing a five year follow up study to see if funding has shifted because when the first study was done five years ago, um, the report card was not great in terms of how our respective portfolios were reflecting the populations of the city. And so that's one of the things that started prompting shifts in how funding happens, is because we realized we were, rep we were supporting some folks, but not all the folks, and not enough folks in different communities. So, you know, even though it can feel like do I fit in the box? Do I not fit in the box? How do I get in the box? Have I ever been in the box? I mean, I think we all have to really dig in and think about it as this is a deeper conversation about what do we want our city to be? And who do we want to help in our city? And that's something that we're all thinking about all the time. Um, anything else? Well, we ended just a little bit earlier than we were supposed to, but we are now opening it up for Q&A, and I hope I'm not making anybody scramble with that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Ellen and panelists, for um, this, what feels like an intimate and honest um, conversation, and I love, I think the world of you as colleagues, and one of the reasons why is because every time I listen to you, you share your humanity. And it's not just about a business relationship or a transaction. What you heard from each of these folks is who they are as human beings. It's such a privilege to work with you, so thank you. So we will be taking Q&A from the audience here with in-person folks, but we also have quite a few people who are live streaming today. So my colleague, Zach Winnenberg, who is, there, Zach. Um, Zach and Aruj, who you already met, we're going to be rotating between um, questions from our live streaming audience and questions from folks who are here today. Um, let's see. So Ellen is going to be joining the panel. 
as a panelist, and I will do my best, but Ellen too, to also represent Arts Work Fund with questions, if we can. Um, so Zach will be reading us questions from the virtual attendees, a rouge from the mic, as I said, we'll be alternating. If you are here, please raise your hand and a rouge will come to you. Hold your question until she comes over so that um, you can speak into the mic, that way the folks who are live streamed can catch her, capture it. Um, and I also want to say, um, we ask that you keep your questions to the topics at hand for Ellen, Aaron, and Richard, as well as myself with Arts Work Fund. We know there's lots of other questions that you might have, but we're going to stick around after the program closes, and you can talk to us, any, any one of us, individually. But really what we're here to talk about is the future of general operating support for arts organizations. So thank you for being thoughtful about that. And then finally, when um, a rouge comes over to you, if you would tell us your name and who you represent, because not all of us know everyone. So I'm going to start with a rouge. Hi, thanks so much. I'm Tom Clues, Crossing Borders Music. Nice to see you all. Um, uh, my question, uh, I think Commissioner Harkey, you kind of alluded to this, but uh, in, a, in a country where for every dollar of white wealth, I think there's 11 cents of black wealth, um, would you consider untying the grant amounts from the size of the budgets, uh, the size of the organization's budget? Yes. <laughs> I think we've been talking about that a lot, and I think, you know, part of it is, you know, you need to kind of make changes incrementally, but I think that, you know, the larger grant amounts in our City Outs program goes to organizations that have larger budgets over, you know, I, I forget what the actual kind of, um, but, you know, organizations that I think have like three million and above, right, which are organizations that are large historically you know, not historically uh, BIPOC serving organizations because of the kind of historical and systematic stuff that we all know exists. So I think that is the kind of, I think one of the next levels that I think of evaluating how these general operating grants are dispersed is um, changing, right? That kind of criteria that, um, you know, larger organizations get larger grant amounts, right? Like that is just, naturally that is perpetuating right an inequity within the system. So I think that's next. Thanks for the question. One thing I just add to that um, is that just like not all nonprofits are the same, not all foundations are the same. So there actually are rules for private foundations and I'm not dodging the question and hiding behind the private foundation thing, but just to explain what has to happen. Private foundations have different kinds of rules from the IRS about how much we are allowed to give. We can give it, but it actually can put the organization in jeopardy. You've heard of tipping. Some folks believe it exists, others don't. My thing is, is that all, I, all it needs to happen is to one organization, and that's bad. So it can be handled, but a foundation might ask you to get a fiscal sponsor because we need an organization with a bigger size budget. I'm not gonna go into the math equation because it's really wonky, but if you hear from somebody that's, the great thing is, is the more government money that's given, it kind of frees up us to give more money, but it's hand in glove, and so that's something that if you hear that from someone, it's not because they don't believe in your organization, it just means we're trying to make sure the rules don't hurt you. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna add to that because I think, you know, that, I think there are some real challenges there, but I think that kind of notion that we can't <laughs> give larger grants to BIPOC serving organizations because they're not going to be able to handle, there's a certain not going to be able to handle them, or if we give them too much money, you know, it's going to overshift their capacity to be able to, like, all of that has really, really factored into, I think, philanthropic decision making as a kind of, um, what is the word I'm looking for, excuse, right? to not do that, to not do the work, right? And so we have to really not make excuses for doing what is absolutely the right thing, right? So it's incumbent upon all of us, right, to if there are barriers to doing the right thing to immediately identify or work to identify a solution because we can't use things like that, right, um, 
to limit, right, the amount of money that we are giving to, um, and the, the m amount of money that we are investing, right, in BIPOC serving organizations. Totally agree. Richard, do so you have anything to add? The, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the quick thing I would just say is that if, if there's a foundation that says we don't give to groups with budgets, you know, under this amount, that's usually that indication about some concern in that way, or just ask them, like, can I get a fiscal sponsor? Can I get another organization that I can give them, that you can give the money to and it can get to me? I'd like to add one more thing. <clears throat> um, on top of the whole budget size, right, as a structural inequity when we determine grants based on an organization's budget. Another layer to that is the duration of a grant and how many grants, right? Multi-year grants. If we're only looking at multi-year grants for large organizations, and thank you, Commissioner Harkey, for giving the context, right? Historically, we know larger organizations tend to be X, that organizations with larger budgets tend to be X. And so then if we are also only committing multi-year funding to the X, that is another structural inequity. And so part of what we're working on at the Field Foundation is how do we then position also small organizations, lower staffed organizations, BIPOC organizations, to be able to have the same type of access, right? Because we know that that has historically just not been the case. And that's just the other piece of that conversation because we know that getting a one-year grant can be great, but that doesn't let you prepare for the future, right? And being able to prepare for the future means a million and one things for an organization, as everyone here knows, I'm sure. Right, so just know that you know, on top of just the budget piece, the grant size to the budget piece, it's also that other layer of the number of years, the commitment, the pledge, because we just know, right? We just know what we know. Speaking for Arts Work Fund, um, two really, the exciting evolutions for us most immediately are offering three-year unrestricted grants, but also, um, there is, we're asking in the grant application, what, how much do you need? That doesn't mean that Arts Work Fund will be able to support every successful grant seeker at the amount that they request, but it is a driving factor in ultimately what will be the decisions in the grant amounts is because it's what you tell us that you need. Um, and it helps keep the smaller groups from being less than competitive with the larger ones that we're very excited about. Do you have anything to add to that, Ellen, regarding Arts Work Fund? No, I mean, I just, everything that everybody has said, and Arts Work Fund, I think that's one of the reasons why we looked at multi-year funding is for exactly what Richard said. It's not just about the amount. It's, I know when I was running a small arts org, if I could plug in a number for three years, that made me super happy. So, um, you know, that's one of the things we're looking at as well. Thank you. Zach, what do we have from our lovely live streamed audience? We're so happy you're here with us today. Yes, I'm happy too. Can you all hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue Ellen, and thank you all uh, on the panel, and thank you all uh, grantees for joining us this morning. This feels like a very special, a very unique gathering of Chicago's creative community, and I'm so thrilled uh, to see you all here today, and thank you to everyone who's joined us online. Um, uh, the first question from Zoom comes from Deidre Huckabee. Uh, she's a grant writer working for many arts organizations in Chicago, but she's here today on behalf of MacArthur Treehouse grantee Live the Spirit Residency. She says, new and significant DK support has changed the game for our organization through the larger and multi-year grants from the City Arts Program, as well as through the Chicago Presents and Neighborhood Access Program. Are these new programs here to stay for the long term? If Mayor Lightfoot could increase the city's investment in arts and culture, couldn't a future mayor reverse the decision? I'm not worried about it. Um... <laughs> Uh, um, you know, we've had, you know, all indications is that Mayor Elect Johnson is also a really impassioned supporter of the arts. Um, you know, we have worked very, very hard um, over the past couple years. I think the agency, I'm very, very proud of my team. I think we make, are making um, exceptional, I think, progress. Um, and we've worked really, really hard, I think, over the past uh, couple of years just to increase our visibility across what we call the enterprise, right, across the city, and to um, kind of advocate um, for the arts and build relationships for pe with people who make decisions 
um, not about budgeting and that kind of thing. And so I think that the, the money and the influx of money that we're seeing specifically from the corporate budget is you know, something that's uh, here to stay. I would be very, very surprised if that was taken away. I think my job, right, is to ensure that that level of funding increases, right? I'm not really worried about it going away. I'm worried about <laughs> more, more money. Um, so that is something that I'm focused on is not getting comfortable or sort of complacent with the current level of funding that we have because needs continue to increase, right? Um, the two programs that the, uh, the woman mentioned, City Arts we've talked about, I think Neighborhood Access Program um, is also a program. The actual application is open right now and the, the deadline for um, idea submissions is May 19th. Um, that again is a program that's focused on uh, neighborhood access, so it is open. Uh, the eligibility is much more broad in terms of, again, social service, community-based organizations that are eligible to apply. Um, it's one of my favorite programs that we've uh, launched just because it has that really kind of broad community-based uh, focus, and um, we're seeing some really exciting, I think, projects come out of that, that we're funding SSAs and Chambers of Commerce, some of which are doing really exciting, um, you know, community development, art and community development work. Um, so yeah, those programs are definitely, um, I think, solid and, and, and definitely here to stay. Thanks, Erin. Arouge, who do we have next in our audience? We had a question back here. Uh, my name is Margaret Caples. I'm executive director of the Community Film Workshop. And part of my uh, question has already been answered. But I would just like to say, as one of the um, organizations of color, that we really appreciate the new guidelines and the new support. In fact, all of the foundations represented here today have funded uh, the Community Film Workshop, are currently funding us. Um, uh, we also received um, a grant from the uh, Chicago Cultural Treasures, and in that group, our organization is 52 years old. And for us to have to wait that long, <laughs> I'm, I'm serious, I'm very serious, for, to get the kind of funding we need with the kind of work that we've done, and it was all of us. And to be in a room full of people of color that are just now, uh, who have done excellent work, excellent work on a shoestring. And, uh, 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 and one of the things, I had a meeting with my staff yes, yesterday, and as I've been around long enough to know the cycles of funding and uh, the political uh, arena, to know that if uh, people change, and so we need to think long term about how we're going to support organizations of color. And secondly, uh, we have to think in terms of the political because our money was fun, uh, uh, cut off from us in 1971 after one year of funding by a Republican administration. And so I'm just saying that if we, uh, we have always suffered under a Republican administration in terms of the arts field period because they're going to make sure that the major institutions survive but the smaller organizations don't. And thank you for your comment. Do you have a question for our no, panel? No, no. My, okay, my question finish, was I'm sorry, finish your statement. My, yeah, it was my statement. I just want to thank you and I'll let everybody here know because I don't see many people of color here, the, how we feel and how uh, proud we are of the stance that you're taking. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Zach? Uh, yeah, um, so uh, I have a question from Christoph Pricing, uh, who represents MacArthur Treehouse grantee Non-Op Open Opera Works. Uh, Christoph is en route to Chicago right now. Um, he mentions that one of the panelists, I think it was uh, Ellen representing the Donnelly Foundation, talked about an archive program. He was interested in hearing a little bit more about that or um, a follow-up offline, if that's more appropriate. Sure. Um... So one, anybody who 
wants to get in touch with me, I remembered to bring my business cards this time, which is a big deal for me because half of the time I have to check if I have my shoes on. Um, but also all of cards. this is on our website. What? I never remember business cards. I'm the worst at it. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, no, it's just one of those things. It's like, I'm like, really? I have a business card? That's cool. Um, but what I would say about broadening narratives is there is information on our website about it. But, you know, again, we're really interested in... Um, stories, and one of the things I should mention is public access is important to us. So we're interested in, we, collections have things, whether they're digital or they're objects, but we're interested in the stories those things tell, and it's stories that either have not been told, have been told incompletely, or have been told inaccurately, and please just reach out to me, because I'm always happy to have a conversation. Okay, a question up here. My name is Henry Roa. I'm the executive director of the Mexican Folkloric Dance Company of Chicago, and I am on the board of Sones de Mexico Ensemble. We uh, perform together. Uh, he could not be here, Juan Diaz, the executive de director, because he's uh, teaching right now uh, at one of the schools in what he calls the hot spots. He asked me to ask on, the, on the, your new format, whether the office, which is not located in this so-called hotspot that he uh, mentioned, is, will that influence uh, whether uh, we can apply for a grant? Because uh, according to what he told me, that uh, the program was going to focus on these particular hotspots, which he thought would be uh, like Little Village, Pilsen, South Chicago, Humboldt, uh, and also the black communities. Because uh, I've gone to uh, South Chicago, and I went there, and when I got there, to school, I realized that they were all you know, mostly blacks. So I changed my uh, uh, lecture, and I made a r real quick sketch of the balafon. Uh, do you know who, what the balafon is? Anybody? Balafon? Balafon. Uh, th th the balafon was brought to the, uh, Central America by African slaves. Uh, 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 marimba. And that's an African word, too. But okay, enough of that. Uh, <laughs> well, it's an question excellent is, question, Henry. If yeah. I got the first part, which is tell us about whether or not where your business address affects yes. your eligibility when you're talking about either priority geography or priority communities in other times profile. But do you have a, a, a part two of that that we could address as well? Uh, I'm hard to hear, but as I understand it, I, I can just repeat my question is, does the location of the office, which is in Rogers Park, affect or do the applications have to be for, or the office has to be in one of these hotspots? That's all I can understand. That's a great question. Um, I'll start for Arts Work Fund. Your office location does not affect whether or not you're eligible, and we look at who you serve versus where your computer might get plugged in to get recharged. Thank you for the question, Henry. Um, this is a really big question that we contend with a lot at the Field Foundation, specifically because we do have our heat map priority regions, and the heat map priority regions really do reflect largely the south and west sides of Chicago. But let's be clear, this is not a, like a yes or no. It's not a, oh, we're gonna cut you out completely if you're not within this specific geographic boundary. That's not how we think of the ecosystem, right? The ecosystem is everybody in that and all the actors that play within the ecosystem. So it's not a yes or no, but the priority is yes. So we're saying that proximity matters. Organizations located within the south and west sides, within the heat map, do matter because the proximity and how folks can access, engage, and just get to a location does matter. But it's not an end-all, be-all. If you're located in the loop, if you're located in different parts of the city that aren't specifically within the heat map, and you do do, or like do your organization does do significant work within those regions, that is noteworthy, right? We're not gonna say that, oh, 
you have an office in the loop and you do 100% of your work in these, in these spaces, but you just don't qualify because your, your computer is plugged up in some tall building in, in downtown. That's definitely not the case. But really, we do want to say that yes, it does matter, but there's an and to that. Thank you, Richard. Aaron and Ellen, do you have anything to add? Um, no, I was just, I think uh, our approach to it is probably similar. When there is this sort of geographic um, requirement, then it does require that um, the organization be located within those communities because, again, and just to echo, like that proximity is important. <laughs> uh, and we need to be investing in organizations that are invested in those communities, have historic track records within those communities. Um, prioritize that work rather than, um, you know, supporting organizations that might be coming in from someplace else um, when there are organizations that are present that have been doing that work for decades. Yeah, I would say we're the same. We're interested in where people are doing the work and, and on the regular, not just, you know, recently started doing things. The only other thing I'll add is for really small arts organization, the office is often your apartment. So we also look into that and make sure that, you know, where you're working regularly might be a little bit different than where you live. Um, but if you do have an office, we do look at, you know, is it in the community that you're serving? Thank you. Zach, who do you have from us live streamed? Hello? Oh, here we are. Um, I have Nicole Dreisky, uh, who represents MacArthur Treehouse Grantee International Children's Media Center. Uh, Nicole says, I'm very curious about the role that human interaction will play in grant making with all the foundations represented here. The vast majority of grants are submitted online. What role will site visits play in grant making and will program officers be available for short chats before or when grants are submitted online? Um, I can speak to that a little bit because um, the neighborhood access program that I mentioned, we've taken a kind of a new approach to uh, grant making within that program. So you can kind of submit, it's a much, much more simplified application that also includes an interview. Um, so um, you submit an idea submission and then from that idea submission that can like literally be anything, like you could like send in a mixtape, you can send in a video, do a PowerPoint, like whatever like moves you, that can be your idea submission, right? So we can start to communicate lessen barriers to access just by letting people tell their story in the way that is most authentic to them. So that's first, first part. The second part is once you're invited, then there is a much more there a kind of formal application process. But then from there, people actually get invited in to do interviews which is a really kind of human way, I think, of asking questions, diving you know, deeper into um, you know, potential challenges or opportunities. And that has been, I think, really successful, I think, in helping to, um, again, bring people into the grant-making process that may have had challenges before, right? Because you can have that one-on-one -on -one interaction and questions that you might not be able to answer or. Um, you know, within an application review process without having that direct one-on-one -on -one actor interaction with an organization can be answered, right, when you have that person directly in front of you. So that um, sort of risk, right, gets a little bit um, alleviated by having that sort of direct one-on-one -on -one interaction. And so I think that allows more people um, into the process. So, you know, it's not possible with everything. Certainly, as I mentioned, we give out, you know, 700 grants a year, so it's not I, you know, not something from an administrative standpoint that we can do for every program, um, but certainly with some of this kind of more smaller boutique programs, we're able to have, I think, more direct one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction. I'll just say for Donnelly, the best part of the gig is going out to see shows. And so we don't really do site visits because you know, let's be transparent. When I was running a small org and somebody came for a site visit, I got the dog and the pony out and everything looked awesome. And it's all about, let me, let me tell you about why we're wonderful. And that's important, but you know, you show how you're wonderful every time you do something on stage. So we go out and see the work. Um, it's on a three-year rotation. We see, it's one of our application requirements is that if you're coming in with an app, we need to come out and see the work first. Um, because it also lets us see who you are in your communities. Um, and then, 
Abigail Madden, who's here with me, who works with me at Donnelly. Seriously, it's the best part of the gig, is going out and seeing shows. I'll answer for Arts Work Fund that um, what's happening where we are at right now is still a work in progress, so I can't respond specifically to what's gonna happen between when a group applied and when decisions are made. What I can say is the amazing Marsha Festin and Lynette Miranda are, have been accessible to any grant seeker at like midnight, they're responding to emails with questions or setting up a conversation. And the same will be the case once decisions are awarded, that anyone who is a grant seeker can reach out to them for input feedback. And the conversations both the conversations before a group applied are absolutely a part of the decision-making process. Um, while this isn't about the Driehaus Foundation, I do want to take a minute to share with you one of the reasons why I am so proud to work for the Driehaus Foundation, is that we meet individually with every group who submits an application. We did throughout the entire 20-year MacArthur Driehaus process as long as a group was eligible, and we do it in all of our other grant making programs, and we also see the work firsthand. I agree with Ellen, it's one of the best parts of the job, and to us at the Driehaus Foundation, that personal connection absolutely informs our thoughts and ultimately what our board decides. Um, I'm so proud of that. Do you have anything you want to add, Richard? Yeah, um, thanks for the question, Nicole. Um, for our program, A Road Together, there's no formalized site visit process, right? So if you submit an application, there's no, you know, there's no follow-up from me to say, let's, let's find a time, everyone look pretty, and then we'll get coffee, right? That, that's not, that's not going to be the case. That has historically been the case with Field, where we've had a site visit with every applicant organization. We're shifting that largely because of capacity and the, the kind of size of the program that we're trying to envision, but the, the kind of very clear point I want to make, though, is I'm always available. If you send me an email, I, I don't know how many folks have ever emailed me in this group, but I am responsive. And I know that about myself because I have a very toxic relationship to my computer and my <laughs> If you send me an email, I promise you that within 48 hours, you will have a response and probably a meeting set up, right? Because that's just who I am and how I've kind of just been brought up in this, this work culture. Um, I'm sorry if I have not responded to you in 48 hours. Um, if that landed in spam or my junk mail, my deepest apologies, but no, like, this is my commitment. It's recorded, it's on a Zoom, right? Within 40 hours, for sure. Like, I, I'll, like, I'll say that that's like the reality for me. When it comes to, you know, how we at Field engage with site visits, part of the reason why we ended up in our role is because of foundational knowledge of the sector that we're working with. So for the arts, you know, I have always tried to embed myself within the ecosystem. I'm not someone who's never been an artist, never looked at a painting, never went to a show, and then ended up in this position. Right? That is just not the reality of the case. I'm not going to say that I know every sector, every discipline, every method of expression, every community to a T. Absolutely not. I'm also on a learning journey, but I really want folks to be able to understand from my perspective, that I'm not someone that's starting from zero. I'm not someone who is going to say, my foundation comes first. I believe community comes first, and that means all of you. Right? So the position of the site visit, imperfect process. Philanthropy is imperfect. We know this. But know that the folks that are trying to do this work, I think everyone here on this stage is committed to trying to do the work the best way that they can. Thanks, Richard. I do want to say one more thing more broadly. Um, not every individual who works in grant making has the capacity to talk one-on-one, -on -one, either before or during the review process, but that doesn't mean that they don't hear you. Um, those of us who have the advantage of being able to talk to you one-on-one -on -one for us, it, from my perspective, what it does is help level the playing field. Not everyone is as strong of a grant writer as they are of standing on stage or actually demonstrating through the work that they do. I would encourage you, if you don't have an opportunity with a funder, to talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, and especially if you know that, share stories that come from your constituents when you're applying, because those stories can speak volumes. And think about what you can't 
capture that you would want to in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, and it's okay in a grant application, especially if you feel like you have no act interaction, like humanize it, make it real, and that can really help. Um, for example, I've been a DK panelist for, I don't know, it was like 16 years. Finally, they couldn't let me do it anymore. Um, so it's been a while before Aaron. And one of the things that always stood out to me as, as, as a participatory grant, making, grant maker, because I didn't have the advantage of talking to folks one-on-one, -on -one, is people who shared stories, and especially who spoke not from an artistic director's perspective, but what does an audience member say? What does another type of program participant say? And those really help bring to life what might not happen in a one-on-one -on -one interaction. Aruj. Yeah, we had a quick here. Everyone, thank you for having us here. My name is Omar Torres Cortright from the Segundo Ruiz Belvis Cultural Center in Hermosa. And uh, uh, this question is primarily for Richard. Um, so there is a big decision that all of the potential grantees of this program have to make, and that is whether we go for the 50 or the 100 multi-year. And, and it's kind of a tough decision because we're going into uh, a different pool of candidates, you could say. And uh, we know more or less how competitive uh, and what were the chances of getting the grant with the MacArthur Treehouse. And now it's kind of on a little bit unknown. We don't really know how many people are gonna apply. Or, and there is, of course, uh, what you mentioned about the the 25 first organizations that are gonna be chosen. And my question is, so does Phil keep the regular giving cycles? That means what you, 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 you were doing with the, our program before where it was, you could apply in the fall, in the winter and spring, or if you apply for this coming opportunity, you have to wait a, a whole year to apply again if you're not one of the grantees, that's my question. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'll answer that in the parts I can, in the order I remember. Um, so the first, the first piece is the A Road Together art program what is the evolution of Field's current grant making. So the three cycles that we have operated on will no longer be the case. It'll be the one cycle per year and that is Good and bad, right? We, we fully acknowledge that. The reason why we went this direction is because we will be employing a participatory grant making process for the three year grant. And so we really want to have all of the submissions come in so they can be you know, reviewed at the same time. And the other piece to that is because of the budget. Historically, when we've had the three year, or the three cycles rather, not three years, but the three cycles per year, we always see the first cycle has the most grants, has the most number of uh, you know, grantee partners within that cycle, and then the very last cycle, a few, right? And depending on the time of year, maybe you have staff that, you know, you just have much more dedicated staff at one part of the year than the other, but then the funding isn't distributed equally in that way. It just doesn't always make sense, right? So if we're able to do this all at the same time, all organizations can be reviewed under the same budget, and we can make much more equitable decisions that way. So that's some of that, that rationale for that piece. So yes, one cycle moving forward, which is the current cycle that's open. Um, we have an application for the art program that'll be due May 15th um, next month. And again, this will be the one cycle that we have for both the three-year and one-year grant. To address that first question, I believe, of you know, how do you decide as an organization to go towards the one-year program or the three-year program. This speaks a little bit to what we were speaking about earlier about the kind of structural inequity um, of small organizations not always being able to access three-year opportunity or multi-year opportunities. And so what I gotta say is, it's up to you. Um, I know that's not a great answer, right? But at the same time, I'm not here to prescribe to say, oh, you're under a certain budget, you should only apply for the one-year grant. I think small organizations should have every opportunity to apply for a multi-year grant because that's just the reality of what I believe in, right? And that's the structure of our program. So it's not a perfect answer, and I can't tell you necessarily um, what the competition, quote unquote, looks like. 
This is the first year of our program. We don't know how many folks are applying. We won't know until the very last day because a lot of folks will submit on the very last day. Um, and so I can't tell you what the, the numbers or the accounting will look like. Um, but we are asking organizations to really pick one or the other to really ease up some of that traffic flow. Otherwise, the applications are identical. If you submit one, you can submit the other. Everyone would submit to both, and then that would be a, a journey for us on our <laughs> end. Um, and so like we're saying, pick the one that you think that your organization believes that you're, you're best suited for. Not every organization you know, has the capacity or has the desire every time to commit to a three-year grant, right? We know that. We know a lot of small organizations also want to do their thing. A lot of big organizations just want to do their one thing, right? Some spaces might want the three years because they want to be strategic and plan in other ways, but these are decisions that y'all know your organization the best, make the best decision for your organization. We know the history of philanthropy as one that loves to gatekeep. We're not trying to gatekeep this decision. Thank you, Richard. Zach, what do we have from our online audience? This next question from the Zoom room comes from Chrissy McEachern from Filament Theater. Um, and Chrissy begins by acknowledging that this may be a bigger issue in the theater industry uh, as she does not have insight into any of the other industries. But on the topic of equity as an increased focus area for funders, is there any thought being given by funders on evaluating the experience of artists and staff being employed by the grantee organizations. To put it more bluntly, many organizations have reputations in the industry for notorious mistreatment of their employees, but yet continue to receive funding that allows them to continue these cycles of mistreatment. How can funders partner with organizations who are fighting against this behavior to make a change? Wow. Who wants to take that one? Thank you for being bold enough to ask that question. We really appreciate that. I don't, I don't know that I have a good answer to that, and I'm, and I'm sorry that I don't. Um, you know, I think, you know, sometimes within these kind of panel discussions as we're reviewing applications, this kind of information comes up, right? And it's a difficult thing to be able to decide how that factors in or doesn't factor into the, the process because it, you don't have any validation of that, right? And we're also just not in the you know, business of being investigators, so it's hard, right? But I think I have been you know, in situations um, where you know, people have, um, as a grant-making organization, people that have worked for agencies have reached out um, when they see you know, something with a particular program that we have funded or an organization that we have funded, they have reached out to, to DCASE and they have made it known to us, which allows us the ability to then reach out to that organization and have a conversation. Um, so I would just probably advise to contact funders um, to you know, air any challenges that you might be having as a staff person or an observer to a program or an organization. And then I think, you know, the, the foundation or the city, I think, would have to, you know, think about, I think, you know, best you know, next steps. But um, certainly don't be quiet, and whoever you can get that information to, um, please do. Yeah, I would just um, plus one on that because, you know, again, that's the part where this dynamic is weird. Organizations typically are only going to tell us the best things about themselves. And so we have to keep our ears to the ground. We have to trust you to call it out. Um, I will say that I think everybody is paying a lot more attention to practice. What is the practice of an organization with its employees, with the work that it does, and not just the product, which was a focus for too long. But I think that we're shifting that. Thanks. Arush, we had a question up here. I'm sorry, everyone. I'm trying to get to everyone. Hi, good morning, thank you. Um, my name is Leela, I'm with Chopin Theater. Um, my question is if the panel could provide some insight into where artistically focused organizations fit into your current funding priorities. For example, at Chopin Theater, we have, we've been operating for about 30 years, 2,000 different programs, art programs, so there's no social, ethnic, cultural issue that we haven't tackled, and um, I just like to 
know if your lens is artistically focused where we would fit into your, your current funding priorities. Maybe I just need a little clarification on what artistic focused is because I would, I guess I would argue that all of you are artistic focused uh, organizations as cultural organizations, so maybe just a little bit more clarity on that definition specifically would help me answer. Our, our mission is not socially driven, it's artistically driven, and while I understand um, the BIPOC focus, our, all of our programming over those 30 years has naturally covered all of those issues. So with the new funding direction, I just like to have some insight to where we might fit in. Thank you for the clarification. I don't, I don't need to be the one to answer it though. Uh, um, so here's the, here's the thing, like for me, this isn't a zero sum game, right? Like we need to start thinking about this hol holistically, right? And we need to be, um, growing the pie all the way around. Everything deserves our support, our love, our funding, right? We need to address within philanthropy that there have been historic inequities that we need to address strategically and directly, right? That have left certain organizations out of the funding mix, right? Out of the philanthropic funding mix. So we have to change and acknowledge, right, the systems and structures that we perpetuate as grant makers to eliminate those barriers to entry. That doesn't mean that um, there isn't, there shouldn't be room for funding other organizations, but we just need to eliminate those things that we are doing, right, that are preventing people from accessing resources. So I just think we need to think um, kind of somehow challenge ourselves to get out of the mindset that it's this or that, it's everything, right? But we need to create a system where everything, right, can exist is my answer. Um, so I don't know if that directly answers your question, but I think that's like my philosophy about this is that um, I think the mentality that if they get it, I can't get it is something that we also need to challenge. Um, and I think we just need to acknowledge as a group, right, that conditions of philanthropy look different, right, in black and brown communities. I was at this, you know, I'm gonna talk a little longer than I thought I was. Um, I was, you know, I'm always amazed when I go to like galas or fundraisers for long or large organizations when they do the paddle race thing. <laughs> and it's like, who wants to give $15,000, right? And it's like, hand shoot up, right? And some organizations can, within one evening, raise multiple million dollars, which eclipses the annual operating budget of many, many organizations that are in this room today, right? So I think we need to acknowledge that that kind of opportunity doesn't exist, right, in most organizations. And we just need to acknowledge that there is a deep, you know, kind of inequity in terms of who has access to what resources. And we need to, I think from a philanthropic side, kind of course correct for that kind of imbalance. Um, so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but there is, I think, you know, just something that we, we're trying to acknowledge and address within the things that we're doing. I, I wanna add one more comment, which is, not every, with the exception maybe of DKs, you exist to support as much as possible and really the profile of Chicago. But many other folks who work in arts philanthropy have to be more specific because resources are limited. And so choices are made about what to prioritize and why for many, many different reasons. The best advice I can give everyone is tell us who you really are and we will do our best to support you if the alignment is there. We can't support groups where there's no alignment or where there's even a gray area often, that's not a possibility, but tell us who you are and we as program officers, um, and I'm comfortable saying this um, on behalf of many of our colleagues who aren't here today, we care about you and it's our job to figure out the strongest positioning possible and present your case. And when we know who, what your true story is and who you really are, then we can try and find that. It's one of the things that makes our job really challenging but also really interesting. 
Any other comments on that? I want to be thoughtful about, um, there's lots more questions, so we'll go a little bit longer. Um, but I don't want to cut anybody off if you have something really important to say as well. Yes, yeah, so I'd love to add to that. It's um, from the Field Foundation perspective, intention matters, right? It's, I think, very easily, we can justify every art discipline as being valuable, right? And so for our specific organization, it's saying, yes, you're doing the work and the why. Why are you doing this work and for whom? And why, is, why does that part matter? Because we know the art is gonna matter. No matter where you go, the art is gonna matter, right? The art matters, point, like point blank period. It's the, why are we doing this? For whom are we doing this? And what is the relevancy, right? Because, you know, I, I give this example quite often. I fully acknowledge the historical context and the value of the Mona Lisa. I could go to Paris, pull off the greatest heist in the world, steal the Mona Lisa, put that in my parents' dining room, and they will never care. It'll mean nothing to them. If I did something else, if I got this really nice embroidered thing from like a shop, right, not the Louvre, just from like a commercial stand, my parents would love it. They would love it so much and it would mean so much more to them, to anything in the, more to them than anything else than the Mona Lisa could ever do. The relevancy matters, right? I'm not gonna say what, what is relevant and what's not relevant. That's part of our questioning, like part of our application is to give y'all the space to really say, this is what we're trying to do and this is why it matters. And that's what we'll, we'll take. But we're not gonna sit here on our high horse and be like, well, this is the ivory tower of philanthropy. Uh, this is, we will only like look at this through like the capital A art lens. That is not the case, right? That shouldn't be the case. I don't believe that that's the case. It really should be, this is what the folks that we wanna serve wanna do. So we're gonna do it. And that's above all else, the relevancy, the intentionality, that's, that's kind of where I really believe this, uh, where our program at that field is really trying to position itself. I'm just gonna add something super practical because <laughs> I used to write grants for a million years. And um, again, I wanna go back to er everything that everybody's doing is important and creates this wonderful city that we're in and this wonderful complicated city that we're in. Um, but foundations are like organizations. You've chosen to have a particular lens, a particular kind of way that you do your work. So I cannot stress enough, just practically time-wise, because time is the, probably the most precious thing that anybody in this room has, because you've got a ton of stuff to do and not enough time to make it happen, is read the guidelines. So for example, I'm always saying, Donnelly does not fund art education. Doesn't mean we don't think art education is important, but we don't fund art education because we've decided to direct our funds to organizations that are supporting working career artists because we just believe that they are a population that is always in danger. So that's why we do that. So it doesn't mean we don't think arts ed is awesome. It is, but we have a particular lens. So I, it drives me nuts when I see organizations that have spent time an art ed, or, 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 art ed organization that spent all that time to submit an application to us, and it's, it's not something that we, we fund. So, you know, on a real practical level, just really listen. I think all of us put guidelines out there that are like super clear because we know that you're spending time on this work and we don't want you to spend time that's not at least gonna get you seriously considered by the organization. Thanks, everyone. Just a quick check on our amazing sign interpreters. Thank you so much. Are you okay with us taking, we have lots more questions. I wanna go for like maybe another 10 minutes. Let's see if we can get in about three more questions, okay? Everybody's cool with that? We're still gonna stay afterwards, but there's a lot. Um, let's go to, I wanna prioritize um, the live stream folks because you all can stay for a few minutes and talk to us informally. Zach? Ah, thank you, uh, and thank you again to our amazing interpreters from Chicago Hearing Society. 
Uh, this question comes from Marielle Merveau, representing MacArthur Driehaus Grantee Comfort Station. Uh, she says, it's often difficult to receive feedback from foundations when you don't receive a grant. Are you building in or thinking about building in the capacity to connect with folks who don't receive a grant if they are interested in getting feedback? I'm gonna jump in right away for ArtsWork Fund, absolutely. We welcome feedback at any point and we will share with you anything that we can to be helpful to you in the future. Yeah, we're always open to talking with groups about what the conversation was at the review panel. The one thing I will just ask is don't contact us six months later <laughs> because we might not remember all of the conversation. We take notes and stuff, but you know, if you can do it within 30 days, that's really helpful. For Field and A Road Together, we have a dedicated chunk of time after uh, the submission and after we will announce you know, the folks that we're partnering with, the organizations we're partnering with, just for feedback, right? I'm not, that, that is not to say that I will reach out to every single organization that um, you know, submitted a proposal, but anybody who reaches out, we will find time to have a conversation, right? We will have a participatory, participatory grant-making panel. Um, sorry, it's a, a whole mouthful. Um, and part of you know, the role that we're asking them to fill is to really provide critical feedback on these proposals. Right? Otherwise, why else? You know, they're not just figureheads to make decisions. They're, they're folks who are really going to engage with every single application and really provide that feedback. And, and, and the notes that they do have for how they came to their decision-making. And we are happy to share that. With folks, right? I'm not going to say which panelist said what, right? Because I don't want folks to be singled out. But in aggregate, you know, we want to be able to share as much as we can, because at the end of the day, this is not a game of, oh yeah, we want to exclude some folks and keep some folks in the portfolio. It's how do we build on top of everything folks have been doing, and how do we work together to get folks to that space where they really feel confident and comfortable and engaged and want to be working. Um, within this greater context that we're talking about at the end of the day. Thanks. I th we do feedback calls just as a matter of like standard process. So when declination emails go out, there's a, a line that says if you want feedback about your application, contact so-and-so. Um, and so our grants team typically spends the, you know, next two weeks um, after a grants or an announced doing feedback calls with organizations that would like to receive feedback. I want to give a shout out, also I've been talking a lot about the grants team, but I haven't acknowledged Kalina Chevalier, uh, <laughs> um, who is the deputy commissioner of our grants and cultural resources team, who is just like the sweetest, smartest, best person to work with. Uh, she's a really excellent, excellent, excellent grant maker, so I just want to give her her props. All right. I'll add one, one more thing um, about feedback. It's um, a multi-way street, right? We, get, we, we, we want it to. So part of A Road Together, the very last question, totally optional, does not get considered for you know, any decision. Tell us everything you hated, tell us what you loved, tell us what you're neutral about, because we'll use all of that to really try to iterate this process. Again, like I've said this a million times now, imperfect processes across the board, but how we can be responsive and to be just incrementally better every step of the way, every stage we do this, is what we're looking to do with everyone. So know that, you know, this is not just, again, ivory tower us giving feedback down, right? This is a, a multi-way street and we need it just as much as anybody else. Thank you for that, Richard. So let's do one more question from our live audience and then one more from folks online. Well, I'll keep this short. Hi, guys. Thanks. Nice to meet all of you. Um, my name's Gretchen Eng. I'm the singing sort of fifth member of a vocal quartet who writes all the grant applications. And um, I'm, I have kind of a shame, shameless question, but I'm hoping it'll help more people than just me. Um, I inherited a big spreadsheet of like grant applications and deadlines and foundations and MacArthur Driehaus was the very first one I applied for. So I'm still kind of new to this. And I'm wondering if you guys, cause you know the topography of uh, philanthropy in the city better than anyone. If you have any other family foundations or any other places that we can add to our lists, bonus points if they're like, music, <laughs> but anything and everything really welcome because, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 
kind of a novice, so thank you. Thanks for the question, Gretchen. Nice to have a face for the name. Guys? I mean, I think maybe we can have a, it seems hard to do a kind of blanket, like here are, the, here are all of the family foundations that might be interesting, plus I think they would like kill us for doing that. And there's a million too. But um, um, I think we can give a shout out, I think, for another family foundation in addition to, you know, builders. Another one that has been deeply engaged, I think, with Artworks Fund as also an extraordinary grant maker is Meg Leary at the Walder Foundation. She has been doing extraordinary, extraordinary work, especially in the performing arts space. So that is one. And she's always down to have a conversation. Um, so I don't think she'll be told too, too. Uh, that I'm offering that up. Um, but yeah, we can you know, definitely have a conversation um, maybe to talk a little bit more specifically about what your needs are because there are, to Ellen's point, there are a lot of family foundations and I think in order to like, maximize the most of your time, you wanna be really, you wanna really think about the ones that are, you're gonna have the most impact with because we all know that, you know, to Ellen's point earlier, it's so sad when we see, um, you know, applicants that haven't clearly re read the get guidelines and we know you labored, right, over this application and you submitted it and off of, you know, some technicality that you didn't catch, like you weren't really eligible. So you wanna, you know, make sure that you kind of shore up, like this is a clear pathway forward for you so we can have a, an offline conversation about that. Um. I want to turn the tables just for a minute and offer you my best tip as a three times director of development and a recovering executive director who did all the fundraising. Um, the best advice I can offer is make a list of what organizations are similar to yours in Chicago and then see who supports them. It doesn't mean that they're going to support you, but especially if that, if a funder shows up on three or more of your peers lists, they're probably a good prospect. If it only shows up once and you have a list of like 20 peers, maybe not, it might be very specific. And you're gonna get a lot of research done very quickly that way. And then just zero in, make sure the guidelines really match with you. We, I think we've all shared that if it's not a match, it's not a good use of your time or ours. But for the ones who are, that's the place to start and prioritize the ones who show up on as many lists as possible and then work your way down to the ones that are only like on two or three. Another good development, I also started my career in development, another good development hack is to read the program and see who funded the program. Um, that is, if you're out and about, like, see who's, who supported it, that'll give you a good sense. You'll start to also see, um, you know, you'll be able to track, you know, who's giving what over time as you start to, live, and what they're interested in, if you kind of track that information, that's another hack. Another kind of very general. I also started in development. <laughs> um, yeah, lots of history and, and I fundraising. Think it, I here. think it's actually one of the best places to start in the arts is if you start in the development department. It's a really good. Yeah. Uh, that's one of Agreed. my like, recommendations. It's a People great skill. Out. Yeah, and it transfers to a hundred other things. Yeah. If you're an individual artist, grant writing is probably your thing. That's a fundraiser. <laughs> um, but other thing to add, you know. Uh, on top of just the programmatic pieces and like who funds what, if, you, if it's like gala, fundraiser season, all of the sponsors, right? That's, that's more than just foundations, right? There are local businesses, there are big businesses, all of these other spaces that have one reason or, an, or another to uh, kind of share out some resources. And those you know, are just other avenues to look at. Sometimes that's sponsorship specific, but sometimes they're just an organization that is just aligned, right? But just other spaces to kind of just weasel into. I'll just add, I was a development director as well, so we should all start a club, Development Directors Anonymous. You can tell us because when we do see a program, the first thing we do is flip to the back to see who's in there, who's funding it. Um, but I think Richard made a really important point. Um, again, you have to remember, first concert, sha -na, na so I've got some time on me. Um, back in the day when I first started doing development work, everybody wanted to get money from Oprah. That was the thing, right? Let's just write a grant to Oprah and she'll be able to you know, fund us for the rest of our lives. And um, that didn't happen. And really, look around your neighborhood. 
Look at what businesses are there. Look at what partnerships you can make. Look at who you can build a relationship with because honestly, that's all development is, is relationship building. Thanks everyone. So Zach, if you can give us a final um, online question, I'm gonna transition over here. And once we're finished, Aruj will wrap up our um, talking part of the program today. Great, thank you so much, Suellen. Um, so uh, as a final question from online, and I just wanted to, before I state this question, I also just wanna acknowledge that there are questions both here in the room and from our Zoom attendees that we unfortunately did not have time for today. Um, the ones that I have in writing, I'm happy to share with our panel after today's program. Uh, and if there's any opportunity for direct follow-up, um, I'm sure that they would be happy to do that with you. So that said, um, I would love to hear from each of the panelists. Um, this question uh, submitted anonymously, but uh, what have you learned from the arts organizations you've helped support? Let's start with you, Sue Ellen. Um, what have we learned from the arts organizations we support? Um, I'm gonna, I can't speak for Marsha on that one, so I'm gonna speak for the Driehaus Foundation. Um, I've learned how much you care about the work that you do. And this isn't something that I've learned, but it has been an affirmation every day in my time at the Driehaus Foundation, which is five years with MacArthur Driehaus grantees, how much the work you do matters. Richard. Plus one, plus seven, plus eight, plus nine, plus 10 um, to that. The other thing that I think I get a lot of is not only do things matter, right? The, the work that everyone's doing matters. It's how you got to that space, right? How you got to that space of what matters because everyone's been on, everyone is on a different journey in life, right? Every single person here has been on a journey. Every organization has probably a collective journey and the foundation of each individual and each organization, every artist in this room, how that ultimately contributes to the larger ecosystem of Chicago and the art sector is so fundamentally important to how everyone in this room is just here today, right? But above all else, like the technicality pieces, what we hear all the time, what I learn all the time is it's not enough, right? Thank you for what you're doing but it's not enough. Or sometimes it's, thank you for what you're doing, and it's not enough. And that's something we know, right? We're not blind, we're not oblivious to, the, to that reality. That is something that we are working on, right? We will continue to work on that. And I'll speak for field, like specifically for field. That is something that we know is a reality and that we will continue to work on every single time we have conversations with someone that maybe has a lot of money and wants to figure out what to do with it. Every time we speak to our board to say, this is what folks are saying, right? Field was one of few foundations that supported BIPOC specific organizations in Chicago. That resulted in a lot of weird, funky competition, right? Within these same groups. And that is not great, right? That is not, that, that is just not a great circumstance that we're, we have this limited pool and then within that pool, folks are, you know, just uh, having to compete. Right, we're trying to address these things. We hear the feedback, we hear the concerns, and we're always trying to learn. And that's why I mentioned earlier, please give us that feedback because we're always gonna try to iterate and add whatever we can. Um, but I've, and I've learned anything else, um, and I'm so sorry I'm taking too much time. It really is um, how much this work means to folks individually, right? How folks, how, how much it actually means to to your personal journey, yourself, to the folks around you, and how that piece alone translates into everything that we're doing, right? And that's the most vague, general thing I can say, and it's still one of the most powerful things I think I'll ever say. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is the honor of my life. It is such a joy to be able to support your work like it this is the best 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 thing right um and i'm gonna have a kind of practical answer to this because you know one of the things that dk's 
often gets asked is, why do you guys ask so many questions? <laughs> um, but we ask those questions because we, we need you to tell us who you are, right? And we need to be able to analyze, right? Trends, gaps, those sorts of things so that we can make adjustments, right? And that happens every time we give out money, right? We go back, we see who these folks are, we see who they aren't, right? And we were able to, you know, through that data that we collect through the grant making process, make actual decisions and adjustments that are based on real data, not us intuiting our way through a solution, right? So, you know, even if you, you know, go through a process, right, just know that that application that you submitted, even if you didn't get the grant, wasn't in vain because we're making iterations next time to try and reach you, right? Our goal is to fund you, not not fund you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, that's, that has been the thing for me. I just wanna let you all know that, that that's the goal. Like we're trying to wrap our arms around all of you, right? And so that information that you submit as grantees is, is incredibly valuable in helping us uh, learn how to do that. So what have I learned from arts organizations besides everything? <laughs> um, I'll give two quick. First off, you don't see a ton of museums to like the banking and engineering world. But every city has museums to art and humanities and culture and many of them because it is the record of our humanity and our inhumanity. It's important. You're all watching and translating and bringing it to communities. It's important. Um, the other example I'll give is my husband is in, he, is, he now loves going to the theater and art, but he, he was a truck mechanic. So, you know, he was like, what is this world that we're in? And I was like, okay. And I, I direct this particularly to small arts organizations. I'm like, so we're having a big party and there's supposed to be a caterer and the caterer has a wreck on the highway and all the food spills all over the highway. If it's a larger, more established organization, often they would be like, we have to cancel the event. Small arts organizations and arts people, you get on the horn and you're like, hey folks, we need some food and they're gonna go to the bodega, they're gonna check like what's in the refrigerator, they're gonna go to the cabinet and they're gonna pull all that stuff together and make the most delicious meal that anybody has ever had and the party's gonna be a blast. You guys are miraculous. You are philosophers, you are prophets. You help us negotiate our lives. You teach us everything. Ellen taking us to church. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you for all your wonderful questions today. I apologize if I wasn't able to get to you. We do have some time built in towards the end. So you'll have an opportunity to speak with the panelists. Um, I wanted to take some time to thank each of our panelists for being here with us today. Um, Ellen, Commissioner Harkey, Richard, and Sue Ellen for filling for Marsha. Thank you for the rich conversation. Um, it is truly a pivotal time for the arts and culture field, and I know the organizations present today uh, appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and answer their questions and concerns. Um, and I think I speak for everyone on stage that has funders. We thank you for allowing us to support the work that you do. I'd also like to thank um, Zach, our arts program officer at the Driehaus Foundation. He was the convening project manager. Um, thank you for your time and dedication for putting this event together, along with everyone from the Driehaus Foundation here today, Ann Lazar, Anita Alexander, Nick Burt, Amy Domogolski, and Tess Tessa Mazer and Brad White, who unfortunately couldn't be here with us today. I'd also like to thank the VAMP Studio for doing all the virtual and live stream for us today, and to Alicia Moylan and Braun Schlafer from Chicago Hearing Society, who've been our sign language interpreters today. <laughs> for
For those of you who'd like to revisit this conversation or share it with your colleagues, we'll provide a link in the next few weeks to all the organizations that were invited to today's event. Um, it's now 11.35 and we have the space until noon, so please stick around, connect with each other, have another cup of coffee, um, and enjoy this beautiful space. As you exit um, through the Guild Room or the Breezeway, please leave your name badge in one of the baskets provided so that we can re reuse it for a future event. And thank you so much again for being here with us in community. Thank you.